This is a long journey that is beginning to define itself more and more as I um, reach the, I guess, the middle of my life. I start understanding that I've been on a path that I didn't anticipate when I was younger. When I was a student, I had a chance to study with two really amazing mentors in art school. One was Saul Bernstein. He was a professor of painting and he also uh, created digital art. So he, he had one foot in technology, but he was also teaching the, the real power of traditional painting and figurative painting. Velasquez and Rembrandt. And he'd talk about these artists as if they were alive and, and that they needed to be addressed and that they had a meaning to us, that they were not dead and they were not in the past. Every idea that he gave was about how to impact emotion, how to impact thought, and it was, it was very much different than the tone which the art world was, was set at at the time. It was the 1980s and a lot of the art was based on kind of whimsy and or um, uh, bright colors or a lot of irony and sarcasm and he was talking about truth and when you're 18 years old this is very powerful this is very intoxicating and then I'd leave his class I'd go to work with professor Hans Burkhardt and Hans Burkhardt was the last of the great American abstract expressionists. He studied with Gorky and Hans Burkhardt would come in, he was an old man when we worked together, and, and he would sit with me and, and, and talk about how, he, how art should, should affect the soul and art should talk about the great human condition. And he was known for a series of paintings based on Vietnam where he had actually fixed human skulls onto the canvas. So he had this huge message about how do you depict the human condition? How do you pick something meaningful and and he'd sit in the back of the room and do these incredible pastels and these incredible drawings and um, it was all we could do to keep up with these two people but but they were infusing into us this this sense of purpose this real sense of purpose and I knew that this was something meaningful to me but I had no idea how I was going to to, to connect with this in my own life. I had no idea what would impact me enough to actually fulfill their expectation of what art could be. When I'm painting the human figure, I'm very much aware of the idea of flesh and spirit coming together. Less about the optical reality of how we look and more about this union or this uh, conflict between our tangible bodies and this sort of spirit world when I began doing figure paintings, this was, my, um, this was my motivation. And as I've grown and had a chance to travel, I've really understood that there's a great tradition that, that stems from um, Mexican literature um, called magic realism. Magic realism is a style of, of, of storytelling where you're describing very real um, everyday things but there is a spirit world that opens up and the spirit world connects to it and changes it and, and really turns it into a magical phenomenon and with my figure paintings that's what motivates me um, the, the work that I've done with the nude it's less about simply a breast or or the way light falls on a rib cage or a cheekbone it's about the way there's an, an invisible force that runs through things that connects through things that that um, that can be dangerous or filled with love and and that to me is 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 what motivates me I'm going to use I'm going to use a little bit of a medium called liquin. Liquin is a sort of like a gel. When the gel is working, it feels like melted glass. It uh, makes it a little more brilliant, transparent. And depending on how much or little I use, the paint is either going to slurp around a little bit or remain in place. So I wanted to enrich some of these shadows.
very different way of working. And they, it helps me to work different ways. It's like speaking different languages. I can go back to the first language and understand it differently because I'm experiencing something else, you know. So I'm getting kind of this sense of violet that's just going to run through the shadows here. One of the great things about working in color is using gray. The more gray there is in the painting, the more the color is special, takes on a special, unique quality. So if I'm laying in some violet here, I want to put in some, some gray mixed with yellow. Yellow is the complement of the violet. That's going to create a, a more luminous, more active kind of gray. It's like tinting. It's just building up the, the warm and cool here. It's just such subtle, tiny little thing. It's so subtle, but it, it really threw all of that into shadow there. So what I'm doing here in this stage of this painting, I've developed a background that has this activity moving throughout it. And then I've built in these larger shapes and masses of this woman with her dress and these other figures. And once that's dry, what I'm doing now is I'm going back in and adding these glazes on top, these glazes to accentuate the color and the temperature shifts. It's like adding um, uh, uh, clear layers of glass on top of a black and white photo. And this is a very old tradition that goes back to um, the, the creation of oil painting in the, in the 1400s, in the Renaissance. Um, it still works, and it still sort of provides a sense of depth and luminosity. Um, and my goal for this painting is for it to just be filled with, 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 with light, even though it's a very dark painting, but to have these individual moments of light be carrying the glow throughout the entire image. And the best way to do that, I think, is through this old, old tradition of glazing. Over time, I could see that I was drawn towards people whose lives were fragmented. Parents who had lost a child, uh, a child that had been removed from their home, and then children who had um, no contact with their homeland, or children that had, had to flee their homeland and were refugees. Parents who had had to leave for political reasons. Um, and all of my art, I realized, was about trying to bring that back together, try and, try and bring people back to their roots, or bring people back to their families, or connecting people back to their identity. And I never set out to do that, but, but the experiences that, that I was connected to, that I was attracted to, were compelling me to create solutions to this, creative solutions or educational solutions to this fragmentation. And I really started to understand that art can, art can heal people. Art is not a decoration and art is not merely entertainment. And in our country, where art used as entertainment can generate billions of dollars, I found solace in understanding that I was creating art that was healing people. And, and along the way, probably healing me and probably helping me cope with whatever I was starting to understand about life. Um, and this opened up my own art in a totally different way because my art was no longer just about me painting in my studio. My art was about people. And so when people ask me, you know, what's your medium? Do you use oil? Do you use acrylic? I, I, I usually answer, I, I work with people. That's what I do. That's my medium. I'm going to paint a portrait of, um, of a little girl. Michaela Garrick has been missing. Um, for a number of years. Here's the little mailer that I got when Michaela was first missing. Part of what I want to do when I get this is I, I, I look at these little flyers and I get a sense of um, you know who this person was just from this this almost impossible little photo and she's she's you know if, if she's still alive she's certainly much older and has changed but this is how we remember her and so I'm going to create an image 
um, from this, but I want to I want to bring color to it and, and bring more of a sense of of um, of presence, um, even more so than than what a photograph could give. I like to use oils and acrylics also, but acrylics are nice because I can build up things very quickly. And I'm going to just pour a lot of medium out. I really like to use a lot of wet mediums. And I'm starting on a, on, a, on a canvas here that I've already got some paint on. I like that. It, to me, it, it feels like there's a sense of a world already there. I like to use palette knives. They, they have um, a distinct feeling. There's less of a sense of control. and. Um, I don't normally um, I don't normally show how I paint. This is probably the first time I've actually filmed how I paint one of these because it's not something that I, I do uh, um, as publicly as I do when I teach. I think of it as expressive realism. That's what I do. So I'm going to start off with um, some large masses here, and I just want to fill this painting with color. I want to have a lot of color. Usually when I paint, I'm working in a lot of layers. I, I'm, I'm really uh, in love with the kind of density that paint has. And one of my favorite artists was actually the Renaissance painter Titian, who was a, very much a realist. But at the end of Titian's life, he was doing incredible things with the paint, things that artists wouldn't do for four or five hundred years. Once someone asked Titian how many layers of paint he worked with, and Titian said 30 or 40. Um, and we've x-rayed his paintings now. He actually only had 10. But he was working with a lot of layers. And that's what I like to do, too. So I want a lot of activity. And this is a girl. You know, we, we don't know where she is right now. We don't know her whole story. But I know that there are people that really miss her and really, you know, love her. And she deserves to have this kind of activity and energy um, as part of her memory. I'm going to start putting in some, um, some darker features. I'm going to use some blue. And I'm going to use a brush. This is a really nice blue. And this is so different than painting a, you know, a typical uh, realist painting. When I paint missing children, I am painting a, a very different way. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking in terms of activity. I'm thinking in terms of the way things come and go, the way things disappear in and out of, of uh, of uh, visibility. Um, this is a little girl who um, I know was uh, riding a bicycle with her friends and they went to a grocery store and um, when they got out to the grocery store, their, of the grocery store, the bicycle had been moved. Someone had moved the bike in a strange location. And the girls apparently thought, that's weird. And they ran over to the strange location to retrieve their bike. And it was someone who was waiting for them. They had moved the bike purposefully to lure them away from a safe area. Um, but I like the idea that this face is going to start emerging. Do you see her coming? And she's, she's coming back now, or she's emerging from this. And I want to make sure that um, she has this beautiful expression implied by the way the paint is falling. Um, it has to be about vitality. I don't want to produce paintings that are quiet. I, I feel like vitality is a really important factor. I really feel at this point like I'm almost sculpting. Um, I'm 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 pushing the paint and 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 molding it. Yeah, um, getting uh, the paint to um, fuse into areas around it and and sort of sculpt Michaela's face the way I'm picking it up here from this little silly flyer. The brush is good for for certain effects, but a, a palette knife is this beautiful tool 
One of the first artists who used the palette knife was a guy named Gustave Courbet, who was painting in France in uh, the mid-1800s, kind of before the French Impressionists got popular. And Courbet believed that he could convey a sense of realism with the palette knife that a brush couldn't convey. And um, he was known for doing some really rough, stark paintings and landscapes and nudes using a palette knife. And um, the palette knife then was picked up by various artists throughout history as a way to embellish the surface or a way to enhance the activity of the surface. And it really allows this sort of rugged approach. There's less of a sense of subtlety and nuance. And now I'm moving around and kind of getting more of a sense of softness. You see that? The sense of softness and that creates more of a feeling of depth in here. And I'm working the whole painting. So it's nice to maybe begin a painting with acrylic and then be risky and throw oil on top of it later after it's dried. It's, it's you know, I don't know, these paintings are so much about taking risks for me. Um, I, I've, I've, I've learned to paint over the years by making missing children paintings, by painting hundreds of them. And I'm not painting them for money, so I don't feel like they have to be any sort of way. They're just my sensation of what I'm getting from this face. I love how a face slowly begins to emerge from all of this. It slowly starts to come out. And it's just made up of thousands of little wishes. I wish that this could manifest. I wish that this could create a presence. And I feel like that's the right way to paint. Um, painting is so magic when it's approached this way. It's so much less about technical um, precision, so much less about hitting a bullseye and more about a slow arrival to an intended place. I do regular portraiture all the time with people who just ask me to paint straight ahead paintings. Um, I've got a couple of those in the studio here that I can show you and they're painted in a very different style, much more refined usually. Um, but occasionally people want a, a, a portrait done in this style, which is really the way, this is the way I paint. Like if God came to me or an angel said, like, how do you paint? I'd say that, that's how I paint. When I'm not thinking about trying to be an artist or when I'm not trying to be a, an art teacher or when I'm not trying to think about being good, this is how I paint. So to me it's very natural and um, it's, it's very freeing. I had just shown my missing children paintings at the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C. And we had a display of them in front of the White House and it was a, a big national event. And I got an email from a woman saying, Dear John Paul Thornton, I have just seen your paintings of missing children and I'm working in India. And have you thought about the missing people of Tibet, all the Tibetan refugees that have had to leave their own country? they're missing as well in a different way. If you're interested in meeting me and learning more, I'll be in a little restaurant called the Snow Lion in a little town in India in three months, and um, I'd love to meet you there. And I couldn't believe this email. And I turned to my wife and I said, you gotta read this email. And we read it and we said, let's go. Let's go to meet this woman in this little restaurant in India and let's see what is what would happen. Sure enough, on the day that we were meant to be there, you know, she was there in this little restaurant in, in this bustling town. And through her, we got to meet um, the, uh, the Tibetan government in exile. And the Dalai Lama was there speaking. And we, we, were, we were privy to meet with the Karmapa, who is this holy man. And he blessed our project. And we didn't even know what our project was yet. But it was the idea that people were saying, yes, you're here. Whatever you're going to do is right. We give you the blessings. We give you the keys to doing this. We give you the paperwork. Work, we give you the permission, go to the refugee camps and make something happen. And 
we arrived in Nepal during one of the Maoist strikes. The Maoists were terrorists and they were taking over Nepal at the time and they had announced a strike where they were there would be no electricity that day, no, no vehicles that day allowed. And our plane um, uh, arrived and our, our porter, instead of picking us up in a beautiful car, he picked us up with a vegetable cart. And he said, this is all I can, I can do. You know, I'm even afraid that I'm using the wheel. If I use the wheel, I might get shot, but I think we'll be okay. And he, he carted us through these streets. And we finally arrived at this Tibetan refugee settlement in Nepal. And my wife and I lived there for three months. And we worked with the Tibetan refugees and with the Tibetan lamas on an art project. The first day we got to the camp, I had no idea what we were going to do. Um, but all the kids in this camp knew we were coming and they met with me and, and, and um, I said, well, what would you like to do? And they said, we want to honor our grandparents. I said, why? And they said, our grandparents are dying. They crossed over the Himalayas with the Dalai Lama in 1959 and they set up this camp that we're in and we want to paint them. Can you teach us how to paint? And I started teaching portraiture to these kids and um, they began painting. And during the time we were there, it was such an incredible journey. We toured Hindu orphanages and people who had, who had been suffering from terrible diseases were, were, were contacting us. It opened up doors, it opened up possibilities. People came out of, out of the woodwork to, to invite me to participate in events. Um, and, and projects. And again, I'm, I'm moving farther and farther away from the guy sitting at the easel making paintings. It was, it was painting and then, and then getting these, these invitations to work um, in other countries. Um, I, I worked in Japan. I was teaching uh, projects in China, working in Mexico, working in uh, uh, Europe, and then recently working in Haiti um, with the United Nations. And what has been exciting for me as an artist is to understand that, as I said, my art isn't about my paint, it's about people. And the experiences that that's given me has shown me the way art works in different circumstances around the world. When I was in Beijing, I was asked to talk to the heads of Peking University about why the art of America is different than the art of China. And what they really wanted to know about was emotion. And they wanted me to speak about emotion, but I couldn't use the word emotion. They said, Mr. Thornton, you can come to Beijing, but you cannot use the word emotion or individuality or creativity. And please don't mention the Dalai Lama. And so I went in thinking, how am I going to talk about these things if they don't want me to mention those things? But that's what they wanted. They wanted to learn about these, these components. And I had to teach them telling stories and telling analogies. And I brought art materials. So I had all the professors at Peking University doing printmaking projects. And they all told me, oh, we don't make art. We just teach it. And I said, well, you got to make some art. You know, I'm here from America. Let's do some art. And so they very stiffly agreed that they would do it. They started making these printmaking projects and, and laughing and becoming little, becoming children. And these professors were coming up to me and saying, so this is what it's like. This was an incredible experience for me to sort of touch them and say, hey, make some art, you guys. Um, this is how it feels. This is how it feels in your heart to make art. And then the project I worked on um, just this last two weeks in Haiti was through the United Nations. Um, the, the name of the project was Girls United, um, Haiti Through Our Eyes. And this was the pilot program set out to produce this sort of template. And is it possible that a team of artists or educators could go in, go into the ground, impact a group of young people, and through art and creativity, get them understanding that they have leadership skills and empower them to become leaders in the community. And can you do this in two weeks? And this was what this project was about. So this was an exciting two weeks. I was the visual art component. And we were working in the Pechenville refugee camp, which was actually the, the Pechenville Country Club golf course. It had been filled up right after the earthquake by 60,000 refugees who had lost their families in the quake. 
The earthquake happened in January 2010, but Haiti still looks like the earthquake happened a month ago. So it was the most amazing conditions I'd ever worked in. We were walking through a foot of mud, through torrential rains every day, carrying our art supplies, passing thousands of people still living in tents. Most of the girls we worked with um, had lost family members. Half of them were mothers themselves. Most of them had had children within the last year and a half since right after the earthquake. A lot of these girls were victims of some sort of um, uh, inappropriate sexual um, relationships, perhaps with strangers, perhaps with, with family members. And they showed up. And the art center was actually a tent. It was four wooden poles with a tarp draped over it and a dirt floor. No electricity. They had made wooden benches for us. The floor, the floor was wet and, mu and muddy, but this was the sacred space. This was the sacred space for these girls. And, and by us being there, it was sacred. And I had remembered so many times working with art centers, working with the mayor of Los Angeles, thinking about these multi-million dollar budgets to create art centers. It wasn't necessary. All we needed was the tent and the girl's desire. And we created the sacred space. By the end of the two weeks, we had transformed this tent into an art center. Using clotheslines, we had, we, we had the girls' art up on the wall with the girls' photography, with samples of the girls' writing, and they brought their families. They brought people who were important to their lives. These were girls I was working with who had never held a crayon. The first day I said, who loves art? And nobody raised their hand. Who's made art? And one girl raised her hand and I said, who's worked with a crayon before? And they all got down and wanted to see it. And these were girls aged 12 to 24. And so I realized that my mission in Haiti wasn't to produce this incredible art project that had this social relevance. My, my job was to make them feel safe. My job was to make them feel safe using art so that they could sit quietly with each other and not have to think about anything else. And that's what I did every day. And we'd introduce these, these projects and they would watch how it could be done and they would go right into it and do it. And they were cutting fabric and gluing and coloring and making prints. And that was a great lesson for me, that my job was just to sit back and just let them do it. I find myself least fascinated with going to art galleries and seeing art because that's to be expected. But going into a place where art has no business or into circumstances where art seems lame and, 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 and using art as a tool to have people build up and, and having art function in a way that no one would have expected it. That's what turns me on. That's what excites me. That's what motivates me. That's my art. That's me.